Welcome to the CES meeting. Today is October 19th of 2022. We have Scott from ARX just to talk up uh, at the beginning and he's got to go in 20 minutes. So take it away. Uh, yeah, hi, thanks. Uh, yeah, we had a real exciting meeting last week. It was exciting for me because I finally got to talk to people that know about this stuff and care about it and to say thank you because like the discussion we just had about the details of hardening that, I mean, this is incredibly valuable to us that you all are catching all these tiny little tiny little holes i have a big problem which is explaining this to the world i mean not just me but particularly where i sit um promoting our tool because it contains these kind of features is something people don't perceive as valuable yet they will they want it and they need it and the bosses want it but they just have to put it together so anyway it's just a little preamble of uh okay i'm gonna share my screen just so talk less and pictures more now i put some links in the document and they're sort of designed for you all to play with that was kind of my intent was to give you something interactive um i don't i made them all really quickly so i apologize if they're uh, lacking in uh, documentary content. <laughs> they might just require some spelunking. Um, but also while I'm here, let's see if I can, I should have done this ahead of time, but just briefly, uh, let's see. By some miracle, this actually loves. I apologize for taking up cycles here, but okay. This so this is a an app we've built with the system. So there was a question last week about you know when you lock down the tools that much, can anybody build anything useful? You know, it's it's what we call expressiveness. Um, and so this whole tool is built using Arcs, which is assemblies of little little islands of code that are isolated from each other uh i don't know how well this will stream because i'm streaming streaming but i've got a this is literally a tool we made using our system that's a designer with other tools that we made to do like media stuff so you can hopefully you can see i have a face mesh and over here there's a, a webgl shader we only see your chrome window with two side-by-side -side representations of an initialize app and update function interesting okay i'll go try again Three. ah you see now we see streaming streaming <laughs> is, it, is it live okay does not appear to be live huh well, that's unfortunate. This is screen sharing, right? It's not image sharing. I was trying to show you interactively, but well, in any case, uh, this is a whole tool built out of ArcGIS. So the tool itself is ArcGIS. You can build things with it. It's very exciting. I just wanted to show you that because we didn't talk about that last week. Now I'm going to rewind all the way to the bottom, which is um, so I think I sent put these links in the summary oops i'm going to start with the app so this is the main thing i made oops it seems to make this <laughs> quickest sense to people oh you can't see that either darn it hmm, that's unfortunate well you probably have to or maybe somebody else can screen share this i don't know why my video is not live uh, but if you open this up in the console, I hope you can you see the gray and the black, it should say evil pwned on the right hand side. That's so too high. I'm okay. This part here, which says library evil, evil is one of these little islands of code. And in this case, uh, I'm running ArcGIS with the vanilla isolation, so there's no SAS running, so it's easily, easily owned. Um, and like I said, this is just really useful for. Oh, geez, I'm trying to make it bigger and again, that's not going to work. For people to just understand, this is a pretty good expression of it. So it says it's evil, you've been owned, and says, by the way, this is actually pretty normal. This is just how the world works most of the time. People just, I often call it pants down, but maybe I should, maybe I need a different analogy. Uh, anyway, if I switch to uh, 
success mode, evil's attempts to do bad things are prevented and ultimately evil has failed. Now I have people, you know, trying to bash on it and find holes. Uh, of course, let me turn this off. Yeah. Have you seen our challenge page, the, um, the uh, uh, escape room challenge page on the side channel? Uh, no, and I should look at that. Um, yeah, yeah. I, th I, th I think the, for this kind of thing one. where you're trying to show that that attacks fail, it's very effective. I mean, obviously, you can got to start by just showing some attacks that fail. But the 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 thing that that gains credibility is here. You type in your own attack, and and we'll see if it succeeds. Um, well, yeah. So th this is what I, this this is the last bit is the repl. So okay, it may not correct. be as as well advanced as what you're talking about. Uh, and yeah, I'm sorry, my screen cherry is not working for some reason. But, and this is live, like I said, the links in the, in the minutes, so you should be able to see it yourself. You should be able to type in over here. Uh, so the one thing we talked about was the repackaging we're doing. So I, this, this is literally the left pane is what you type in, the right pane is how it gets repackaged. And then if you look in the console, you can see what happens. You know, I sent this to my team and it was instantly owned because <laughs> I'd forgotten to harden something just like Mark totally warned me of last week. Uh, so, you know, that's good. At least reality conforms to reality. So I fixed that. So that was great. Um, yeah, I hope I hope you can see that and it makes sense. I actually, after we talked, I, I changed the, I simplified the algorithm a lot. So I'm happy about that. It does less it still needs to do a two string it does one two string on an object and expects to get to function bodies so that's just a requirement but other than that um, it does very little manipulation of the code instead preferring to do reflection off the parsed code it parses the code in a lockbox evaluates the code in a lockbox and then extracts the strings when you do the two string are you doing function dot to string open close or are you doing function dot prototype dot to string dot call of function um i don't remember sorry i can't remember i'll look it up but it, it seems to me yeah i don't know i think i'm just doing object to string Okay, so the thing is, object to string is still according to the object. The function can, an individual function instance can override to string to produce whatever source code it wants. Uh, if you do capital function dot prototype dot to string dot call of a function, then it's according to the built the 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 built in um, function to string rather than whatever the um, the function instance overrides it to be. I understand. Thank you. I will make sure to uh, check that using not oh. using the prototype off the object. Yeah, that's uh, uh what it, that that is a good idea in general. I'm wondering what the attack would be in this particular case. So it depends yeah, I mean, what what the purpose <laughs> of getting the two string is. Uh, if if you don't want the function to be able to lie about what its source code is, that would be the only um, situation in which the difference is relevant. Yeah, it's ironic because we don't care about the, the what they wrote doesn't matter. It's only what comes out of the evaluator that matters. So if they lie to us, the lie is the truth and whatever the original thing is, is irrelevant. <laughs> what we don't if, care. We never... We never analyze their source code. That's kind of the point. And I try to avoid trying to do it in an uh, analysis. You, when you get the source code string, do you then concatenate it with other string material? I mean, as you can see on the right, I attach this line on the top and the line on the bottom. Okay. So uh, just as an example of the kind of attack to worry about is if you're doing this with two functions and you're concatenating something um, you know, uh, you know, there are both there are both parts of a larger concatenated string. Then the source code, according to the function, could have 
uh, unbalanced brackets that were ca that were compensated right. by the other one, and then you could. The thing is, in our, in our case, they could just write that directly in the first place. They don't have to go through all the shenanigans because that's again the point. We don't care about how they represent it to us a priori. Okay. By the time we have mashed it together, that's just what it is, and if it. So, the, so there's essentially a first evaluation in the compartment that uh, that produces. The, uh, there's a first evaluation in any compartment that has no powers that produces uh, an object with source code, and then a second run where you extract the names of the functions that were exported by that, and then turn them into isolated functions. Is that right? Uh, roughly, yeah. I mean, the last part is easier now, but but the concept is exactly what you said. So I I don't trust the source code that it's handed to me at all. So I run that in the lockbox because it can do stuff. I'd have to study it to make sure it can't run a closure. Uh, but then whatever pops out is all that I care about. So I just, I put it in a, like you said, a place where it can't do anything at all, except affect its own self. And then so, but I'm saying all I care about is your result. Then I take the result out, run it through this process. And then theoretically, it's safe from doing anything. Now I can run it in a compartment with slightly more powers, right? Uh, or I can yeah. I can run it with actual data. I guess is the thing. And not worry right, about right, it. right. It's an equally powerless compartment, but you're injecting all of its powers through individual function calls. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we'll have to think about how we would attack that as the balance brackets is certainly an issue, but you're taking this and then you're compiling it with the function constructor. Um, so, and there's our- no, There's no function, there's no function constructor. It's an object that gets evaluated. Right? Oh, so this I is an object, so. static object, which is actually kind of funny that linters don't like it. They're like, what the hell is this? <laughs> it's not a thing. Uh, has no side effects, you know, which actually makes me happy when I see that. But what they mean is it can't do anything because it just evaluates this object. It's not returned. If you were to evaluate this as a JavaScript source file, it would do nothing. If you evaluate it, its value is object. Mm -hmm. uh, I definitely do iterate the. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I, I just wrote worked on this like two days ago, but I can't remember what the hell I did. <laughs> You know, and I'm uh, trying to, and on the fly, I'm going to freak out and start scanning files. So I'm sorry, I don't have a crisp answer, but we'll, I'll look it up and get back to you and show you where the source is. So you guys can look at it because I'm sure I've made a 20 mistakes. Well, I've, you know, there's mistakes and there's, is it just a flawed concept? So these are definitely, I know you don't have definitive answers to anything. Nobody does, but I certainly appreciate your guys' attention on it. So you have initialized and update methods on the object that you evaluate. Um, and if I understood, yes, the last week's presentation properly, the idea is that you want this to be fully stateless, such that state can't be accumulated inside of, can't be accumulated by this object over time. So that's not strictly true so there's a state object and by virtue of initialize i mean it, it must sure. yeah, yeah, it must yeah, have yeah. state yeah so there the, are I, versions there are versions where you can say it's stateless and then you wouldn't have initialize and update would just take inputs but, right so it, but there's it, it, a third it, option where we have private private data iterators that don't accumulate state so there's two things there's can i accumulate state of myself over multiple runs which most things want to do because they can cache and it makes them perform it yeah but that's yeah, different than can i accumulate state and communicate it with somebody else is a secondary issue and then the third issue is what things can i fingerprint so it's for fingerprinting often we have opaque data where they can't actually iterate it or see any of it or capture capture any of that data on their own state or very finally we can just say there's no state at all so these are all layers that we have levels of statelessness that we have Sorry, that was very hand wavy. No, no, I get it. The, I think that the first time I actually saw this pattern in the wild was uh, uh, Mark Stiegler presented this idea at a CES meeting, I think 10, maybe 10 years ago in person yeah. at Google um, uh, as, as, a, as a 
uh, the basis for um, a kind of actor model system, I think, on top of an object capability system. Um, or at least that's how I understood it. And so the question is, uh, I haven't reasoned through, so, so it's, it's not that the, the object is, or the, the evaluated construct is stateless in one sense, but can be stateful by having this protocol where it produces updates to the state object in it. But basically the state isn't captured by the object that is implemented here. And I'm, and I, it, it was not clear There's to me. There's a host. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. I was just say there's a host object that's actually ha owns a life cycle and everything. So this object is treated as this like untrusted implementation. So I just reach in and poke the function, these functions. So they're not actually part of, I mean, there's a this, but it has nothing on it. Well, it has, <laughs> it has this stuff on it. So this has this stuff on it that you see and nothing else. Everything else is injected and it's the, the host that's calling updates. So it's host is keeping track of whether the inputs have changed, which is really the whole core of it. Okay. So at the point at the at the point where you're invoking and initializing an update, you are controlling the value of this using reflect apply or something like that. Well, when the, the particle's instantiated, this I'm gonna call this thing a particle. It's it's a particle implementation. It gets instantiated. So again, I create an instance of this object. I think I shove it on a prototype of a object. I don't exactly recall. So then it just becomes impl, and I can call impl.initialize with whatever I want. So it's basically a flyweight model. So the particle implementation itself doesn't have state or anything, it's just functions and, and const data. And the particle uh, and then is the host. Broken. Yes, everything is. Well, yeah, everything's hardened, except for state may or may not be hardened based on the B stateful flag, which is kind of how that's implemented. It just basically makes state useless and inert, but <laughs> that's fine. I don't actually remove it, I just make it inert. Uh, yeah, so the host controls all the input and output. So all particles can do is receive inputs and then they can send asynchronous output, which is just, these are all POJOs. So I never intended to allow typed arrays or any of the fancy objects. We talked about that a little bit last week. I think I may have allowed them sort of by just because they're passed through structured clone, I think. But anyway, it's my, again, all I'm saying is all this was built. No, not all of this. Did I already close it? Because I'm an idiot, I closed it. The, oh, you can't see it anyway. The whole app with the media and the drag and drop and all that stuff. We built a bunch of apps with this. So we know the model is really expressive even in spite of having all the security constraints. It also works really well in sandbox environments like extensions or as welded into other people's apps, which is just all kind of side benefits of having strong security model. Anyway, yeah, uh, I hope I didn't talk too much. And I'm sorry, my screen sharing didn't work for some reason. Yeah, Scott, um, the, uh, I wish I was understanding a lot more of what you're saying, because it's it's all, you know, I understand enough to understand how important all of this is, but I'm not actually understanding it. Um, uh, can I suggest that maybe um, you prepare like a presentation or something and come back and do another one of these with with uh, a a you know a more prepared um, uh, you know, walkthrough of of the the concepts here, and in particular, the thing that I'm you know really want to make sure I understand is where the state is and where the state cannot be uh, as this is happening and the difference between uh, just confined state versus being genuinely immutable where there's no mutable state. 
Um, yeah, let me let me ask a clarifying question. Is it an invariant expected by this system that a particle um, that a particle cannot accumulate data between calls to initialize and update the um, that isn't expressly um, isn't expressly managed through this state variable? Uh, can it accumulate state? It can't accumulate anything that isn't on the state variable. It's the only thing that's writable in its universe, if, if even that. So the inputs are hardened. So, uh, so it, it is expected that initialize in yes. its closure could accumulate state between, or update could accumulate state in its closure between calls. If it's stateful, yeah, absolutely. It can accumulate its own state. Okay, but, so this, okay, that that was that was really a, a crucial part of my question is there's nothing you're doing to enforce that update cannot have captured a local state variable. No, only if you set be stateful to false, I just harden all state variables, and then it just becomes inert, and you can't do anything with it, and it's you can't essentially you just can't, turn, turn you off. can harden you can harden properties, you can't harden variables. I'm concerned about very the, uh, the object right. the object that's set into the state is hardened. So right. you can change state to point to some other thing. I don't that's irrelevant. I'm saying the object, the only object that update can write to is the object referenced by the state variable. Or if, a, if, the, if, if, if the up if the update function is de, is defined in a context where there's a local lexical state variable that update has access to, then update can modify that local state variable and maintain its own Correct. mutable state. Which is the process of the black to white in the REPL is the notion of removing any such scope variables or any kind of other, all identifiers that are accessible to it should be known. And they're all listed there on that, on that isolation REPL. There's a set of globals and there's a set of scope modules. There aren't any other symbols that should be accessible and there should be nothing that's writable other than the object referenced by state. I'll try. Yeah, I suspect that this is defeatable, um, but we'll we'll have to come back. Uh, and, and well, if, if that, but but now we know what the- I'm convinced is. it's defeatable. The question is, can it be fixed? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. But yeah, I, I look yeah. forward to a conversation. I'm sorry I got to run. I will definitely, I mean, if you guys will have me, I'll be back a lot. I will do my we'll, best to prepare, but we'll, I can't guarantee it'll be polished. And we'll, we'll, it will we'll take more time more. to do. Thank you. Yeah. We'll have, <laughs> to we'll have be more well. talk less, will take longer. <laughs> sorry, I keep interrupting. Uh, I just apologize. Yeah. Um, the please, uh, I, I know you're out of time, but please take a look at the link that uh, Matthew dropped in chat. I will add it to the uh, to the minute document, and that that contains our. Um, let me quickly show my screen. Our hardened JavaScript escape room, which has a secret in its closure that is not supposed to be revealed to guest code, and then the attacker is free to write a thing that attempts to guess the secret. Um, and then you can run it in different circumstances, and then there are a number of um, there there are a number of uh, of scenarios that you can attempt to 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 run to see. And one of the um, one of the keys here is that if you if you allow date dot now to exist within the attacker's compartment, then one of these attacks will work uh, the timing side channel. And if you do not, then you are then then we we po we posit that the 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 attacker code cannot guess the secret and um and 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 it's 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 our hope that the community will keep on trying until they continue to continue and, and continue to fail to find an a uh, a vector um so please uh please uh give that a shot thanks i will do uh, yeah, thanks again for your time. And, uh, yeah, of course. And, yeah, see you and, 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 and please do come back with a with a um, representing all of this. And we'll we'll, we'll attempt to we'll attempt to show you a way that uh, uh, that your fingerprint that fingerprinting is possible in this framework, which we will be very sad if we succeed, but also kind of excited to find out. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, well, I appreciate it. I won't be able to sleep without <laughs> at least learning right. it by you all. Anyway, yeah, thanks. All right, bye. Yeah, see you soon. All right, I think that our we have a second topic on the agenda from Alex. Yes, Chris. Um, <clears throat> I was going to do another dry, another run through the slides here in preparation for hopefully presenting this to TC39 in, at the end of November. Um, I don't know if we have time for comments at the end of this, but the presentation itself is about 10 minutes. So let's uh, hope. Okay, so we're talking about uh, proxies and how to revoke a bunch of them at once. And we, I've, we've come across a scalability problem in some detail. So a proxy actually, when we create a proxy, it takes two arguments. You have the shadow target, which is a object representing an underlying object. And it's usually an object vanilla, a vanilla array or a vanilla function. We can add properties to, we can set the extensibility on, et cetera. <clears throat> and then there's proxy that revocable, which takes the same arguments, but returns an object bag containing the proxy and a revoker function. And typically in a membrane, which we're going to talk about extensively as preamble to the actual proposal, we have a membrane that keeps these objects separate. The shadow target is specific to the proxy, but the proxy handler is comes from the membrane and is one of the slots in the proxy. So for an individual proxy, this is fine, but when you have hundreds of proxies, you have either hundreds of revoker functions or you don't care about revoking them at all. And we have in the wild right now, existing membranes that have to deal with this. Mozilla Firefox implements its DOM and then hides a big piece of the internal API via a membrane that it calls cross-compartment wrappers. So when you have to revoke an object graph for a membrane, that means invoking every single revoker function and it also means you have to create and hold those revoker functions in the first place. So let's describe what a membrane actually is. Again, this is preamble. If you have a DOM, you have native code. You have particular items that untrusted code should not be able to access, that JavaScript code coming in will try to access. But there are also certain channels, such as event listeners, the observer bot pattern, that you do want to have restricted access and in inserting it into the underlying native code. The membrane is an abstraction layer that, that prevents or restricts access from what untrusted code can actually see of the trusted code by providing proxies. So the membrane is actually putting itself in between the object graphs. You have an object graph of proxies, which the web code sees, and you have the underlying native code. And if you want to look up, say, the properties of the HTML element, you have a proxy that will make a call through the membrane to get that information. And then the membrane will assign properties of the proxy itself to and create a few other proxies to, to manage that. And each proxy has a one-to-one -one mapping with its underlying object. You also have, as I mentioned earlier, the observer pattern where you may want to pass in from untrusted code an observer for events happening in the trusted code. And so that results in a proxy in the trusted code to the untrusted value. So this provides a number of aspects. We have un security against untrusted access. You don't want a Prox, you don't want web code to access the file system if you can avoid it. You also have limiting what trusted code can do to these untrusted objects. You don't want to accidentally pass the file system access into an event listener. And then if you think about multiple different sources, like for instance, you might have web extensions that get a different level of privilege 
from ordinary JavaScript loaded by the web page. So it's a matter of integrating all these different things together. Membranes are all, membranes provide the capability to make this possible in a somewhat secure manner, more secure than just vanilla untrusted access to the trusted code. So this is why both proxy and weak map exist. But it also means that when you have a document object model, you have hundreds, if not thousands of nodes, and thus hundreds, if not thousands of proxies, and hundreds, if not thousands of refilter functions that have to be tracked after being created and then invoked when, it, when it's time to leave the, leave the web page or if there's any kind of problem. And that's just in the DOM. There are other data structures out there that you, we can easily imagine where this comes about. Now, if you're at the point where you're revoking an object graph, you now have to run a, uh, hundreds or thousands of revoker functions. And that's where we are right now with membranes. We can fudge a little bit with a custom proxy handler, but we still have to create and hold those revoker functions in some place. So the original mem model of membranes that Mark and Dr. Tom Van Cutson came up with was around cells from biology. You do not have to understand biology to understand this model, but it, it's just a way of separating the objects that are untrusted here in the blue object graph from the trusted objects, which are green. And you have semi circle. Just, just let me, let me, the, we, <clears throat> so even in the original, we never talk about trusted and untrusted. We always talk about mutually suspicious. Um, the, uh, is nothing is assumed to be universally trusted. It's that blue doesn't trust green and green doesn't trust blue. Okay, I'll have to update my talking points for that. Um, but right. And the idea is only through proxies are you allowed to penetrate that boundary between the two object graphs. The circles represent the original objects, semicircles represent the proxies. But uh, in the talk of July 2018 at TC39, someone did ask about this. They asked, do they need to understand biology? And I said, no, it, it turns out you need to be, in a three-dimensional way, this is not as this is not a real issue. And even then, I didn't fully understand what I was saying. But then, in September 2018, I came up with a geometric model, which is extremely similar, but takes it from takes it to a three-dimensional a three-dimensional model, as I said. So here, I'm representing each object graph as a plane, where you have the original objects as spheres and the proxies as hemispheres with a flat edge facing those spheres. And the planes themselves are parallel to each other. They never intersect, nor do objects intersect in these planes. It's worth mentioning that they are interchangeable. You can have multiple object graphs. I'll get to that in a moment, but you just want to make sure that they never intersect. You can swap them. You can move them around. The distance doesn't actually matter. It's just a, an, a way of modeling membranes differently. Which means we can have a third object graph with different privileges, different capabilities pointing to these original objects. And again, you can swap planes, no big deal. Uh, currently, we call them hypergraph membranes, although the original name was multi-sided membranes. These names are still interchangeable. But now we gotta talk about why we're here, which is about cleaning up one of these object graphs. Suppose the green object graph wants to be revoked um, or we want to revoke it. What that means is we have to eliminate not just the proxies in that object graph, which the proxies know about, I'm sorry, the, the membrane knows about, but it also has to revoke proxies to underlying objects in that object graph. And those proxies can live in other object graphs, other, other um, 
Okay, I must, I, I'm, I've said enough. But each revoker only has a is a function that clears only two slots, the target and the handler. That's all the proxy knows about. Which, as I said, when you're dealing with hundreds or thousands of them, it's a scalability problem. So now we come to the proposal, the actual meat of what we're trying to do here. What I'm proposing is a shared signal capability where we create a signal and then we pass it in as a property of an options bag as the third argument to new proxy or proxy.revocable. We could share that signal a bunch, a bunch of proxies. And then when we want to revoke all those proxies, it's a single function call. In this particular example, proxy.finalize signal. And this signal would then be a new internal slot pointing to the signal inside the proxy. So instead of the of this proxy having two internal slots, shadow target and proxy handler, we had a third slot for the signal for killing all those proxies at once. That means that we don't necessarily need proxy that revocable. We still preserve it, of course, but we don't need to create hundreds or thousands of revokers. That means less memory allocation. It means less pressure at garbage collection. And at most, we have the power set of object graphs for the number of revokers we need. And typically, n object graphs times n minus one divided by two, which is much, much smaller than the number of proxies that we're creating. Now, we are aware of the cancellation proposal, and we're certainly willing to adjust the methods here or the API as to fit what the cancellation proposal is putting forward. So we're completely flexible on this. We're just put, pitching the idea to see what sticks, what doesn't, and can we actually make this work? And that's it. I am hoping we can move this to stage one and get this into the language itself. Thank you. Um, I have some additional draft slides at the end of this, which I figured if we needed more background on membranes, I could add them. But that's the end of the talk, guys. Yeah, if someone's talking, I can't hear you. I, I, I'm, 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 I was not talking, but um, the, I think, with when when you talk about the 3D, I think that that by calling it 3D, then it you know you then felt like you needed to add all these qualifiers about how it's not 3D. Um, uh, and if you just talk about it as um, parallel, you know these these uh, parallel layers, and then a given abstract object is a column through that through the layers that. One on one of the layers is the actual object, and on all the other layers, and in that same column is a proxy for that object. Um, uh, I think just avoid the term. You know, if you avoid the terms like three D, then you don't feel then then it you you don't you won't need to say things like the distance doesn't matter. Um, if you just talk, you know, or put another way, if you just talk about topology rather than geometry. Um, the uh, unfortunately, but, I haven't really. I have never studied topology, so I wouldn't. Okay, so so just just talk about parallel layers and and then uh, par parallel horizontal layers, and then the abstract objects or the vertical columns, um, uh, and then how in each vertical column, uh, only on one layer is the genuine object, and on all of the other layers is a proxy for that object. Right. I think I think that'll you know that kind of gets the idea across. Okay. Yeah, I was doing this off the cuff, as you can probably tell. Um, I've only rehearsed it a couple times, so I will figure out how to make that adjustment, Mark. Okay. Altogether, I liked it. I thought I thought this was very good. I thought it thinks I think you're succeeding at your main goal here, which is to make a compelling case. About why we need the the um, the the bulk revocation and why the 
what we've got now is really a scalability disaster, which it really is. Um, and, and that was really the main thing you needed to get across is both that the current model is a scalability disaster and that something simpler can solve the problem. Without too much overhead. Yeah. Okay. Um, if there's no other immediate comments, I do want to show some of the other draft slides that I rejected at this point, but I kept them around in case we wanted to bring them in. I don't think they're necessary, but I just wanted to uh, preview them in case people disagree and they want to bring them in. And if there are any slides you think need to be dropped, I'm more than happy to do so, but I wanted to make sure that I kept it as short a presentation as possible to allow more time for questions from the committee. Mm -hmm. That's good. Okay, so the slides that I've drafted that I kept out are these here, which are explaining why membranes are important, the three main features that I talked about earlier. And these are directly extracted from the July 2018 talk, Mark. Okay. So the first one is explaining, okay, we want to, we want to prevent uh, people from setting properties and having them pass through necessarily. Um, and then restricting the other direction of that mutual distrust or mutual suspicion, I should say. I gotta, I gotta get that phrase in my head. Uh -huh. um, and then integrating different components together. I felt that at this point, these, slide, these last three slides that I'm, I have here are not strictly necessary, but I wanted to hear what people thought. Anyone, please? Nuts. All right, in that case, I'm just gonna delete them. If I need them later, I can bring them back. I have them in my original um, talk. But uh, I think, this slide here, Mark, is maybe one of the most important, is to illustrate the design of yeah. a membrane. Yeah. Yeah, this was very good. I don't have anything else for this group at this point, unless people want to offer commentary offline. Well, thank you again for running this by us, Alex. I'm, um, are you scheduled for this? No. Um, that's why I brought it here to this group to see if if this is close enough to being ready for scheduling and yes. also this this is absolutely this is an adequate slideshow to go ahead and put put an item on the agenda linking to this slideshow this slideshow is more than adequate for that okay um a couple process notes i've got to actually write up a uh, a demo slash shim i updated the actual specification last night along with this slide deck and I will need to get uh, invited to the actual TC39 meeting. I'm not looking forward to presenting at either 1 a.m. or 7 a.m., but that's how it is. Yep. Um, and I really hope they don't make me present at 3 a.m. <laughs> the I, I'm 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 expecting to have just a miserable. I mean, this is this is the worst case time zone for me. It's yeah, it's just awful. Um, yeah. Um, that's just logistics. Um, and one last. This is the Acarunia meeting, correct? Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. This is the Acarunia meeting. Uh, yes. All right. Well. Yeah. Pacific, well, Pacific, Pacific time. It's uh, what one a.m. to eight a.m. One a.m. to seven a.m. I believe. One a.m. to seven a.m. Okay. Um, yeah, that is first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, if we were flying to Spain, that might actually work. Um, but I don't have a passport. Uh, the last thing is in terms of scheduling, running this presentation by Fry AM, again, for the general roasting at that point. Um, I just want to get on the calendar for that as well. Okay. Well, um, you say you don't have a passport, but that is exactly what we would expect an international man of mystery to say. 
I am not going to quote any Bond lines, okay? I'm just not going to. <laughs> All right, I'm done. Thank you. Okay, very good. And um, so which of us should invite Alex? Uh, uh, um, Chris or Matthew, I nominate one of the two of you. Um, if by invitation you mean going through the process on the reflector, um, uh, I know how to do that. <laughs> okay. And I think I can find your GitHub GitHub handle, Alex. If, if, if um, yeah, I can do that. But last time I did this, it took a while. Who's your sponsor, Alex? Like what sp what organization? Like their process at the moment. I'm gonna I'm gonna go off the record. 